Good morning, church family. How are you all doing today? Well, glad you're here. Uh, thank you to Pastor Jason Ritchie. He was uh, here last week. We have a teaching team now, and uh, I was over at East Jordan, so it worked out kind of nice. So thank you to Pastor Jason. We have a uh, couple new members that we would like to introduce to you today. So if John and Ryan Hagen could make their way up front, uh, we'd like to introduce them to you at this time. Unless, there they are, good. Uh, also, second service, uh, Roy Angel will uh, be introduced. And at our East Jordan campus, come on up here. Yeah, don't be shy, yeah. Come up where the fun is. <laughs> uh, Destiny Smith will be uh, introduced today at the East Jordan campus. Let's get that. Uh, that's okay. I didn't grab it myself. How are you? Greetings. You want to tell us a little bit about you? Yeah. Sing a song, you know, a little, little bust a move. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, John and Ryan Hagen. We, um been up here for five years now. I've uh, been coming here for about that time. Uh, okay. And finally decided to become nice. members. Nice. And tell us what you do to um, stay out of trouble. So I'm a nurse. I currently look, work at Munson in Traverse City uh, in the OR there. Uh, I've worked in the cath lab here in Petoskey. Um, okay. And Ryan is um, at home with our children sometimes and then she volunteers for the widows groups here nice. and then also with uh, Sunday school in the youth building. Very good, very good. We're glad to, to officially take you in and uh, make you a part of us. So let's welcome them. Yeah. <laughs> Set that down. Hopefully it doesn't fly off and uh, join with me. Let's pray for John and Ryan. Lord, thank you for bringing John and Ryan to Walloon. Thank you for the part of the church family uh, that they are. And Lord, you've created them fearfully and wonderfully and given them specific gifts and sweet spots. So thank you for that. Help them to find their place. Help them uh, to find where exactly. Thank you for uh, Ryan already finding her spot. And I pray, Lord, that you'll use them in wonderful ways. Thank you for their children. Pray for your blessing upon them. And Lord, help us as a church family to love and encourage and welcome them aboard. Thanks again, Lord, for uh, the family of Christ uh, that is your church body. And we pray for your blessing upon this, this wonderful family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you. Nice job. We have, it's not a test, Henry. This is an assist assessment. Some of you, if you hear the word test, no thanks, deliver me from a test. But this is, uh, this is week 10 in our Emotionally Healthy Spirituality series. And we have a wonderfully done assessment answering the question, how emotionally healthy are you? Now, I, I know many of you will say, I'd rather, I'd rather eat glass than take a test like that, and I get that, but I'm telling you, it's really good. I took it, I wasn't terribly happy with all of my scores, but it does tell you, okay, this is, this is where you're doing okay, this is the area that needs improvement. So anyway, we've got some here. As you come in the door, there's a table, we have some, and in our welcome wall, we have some assessments there. So those are free, help yourself. I'd really encourage you, um, especially if you're brave and courageous. How's that, okay? Why should we care about getting emotionally healthy? Why does that matter? That, that's our question here today. Why, why should we even give a rip about being emotionally healthy. And here's the answer. I'll put it up here on, on uh, the screen. Because it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. 
you might know a lot about Jesus, you might know a lot about God's word, but if you've never allowed it to filter down into your emotions so that emotionally you're healthy, I'm sorry, but you're still emotionally immature. You can't be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Okay? Emotional health, spiritual maturity, they go together. They are inseparable. Too many followers of Jesus are chronologically 35 or 45 or 55 or 65 or 75, but still, too many of us are still children emotionally. That's just a reality. Some of us, we, we've never allowed God's word and Jesus to go down below the surface of our lives. Pete Scazzera, he wrote the book that we're uh, kind of using as our platform, Emotionally Healthy uh, Spirituality and Discipleship. Here's what he says. Here's what it means to be emotionally immature. These are some of the things that are going on. We don't know what to do with our anger or our sadness. We've never learned how to handle those. We're afraid of being honest and real in our relationships. Uh, we avoid conflicts, and really our goal, I just want people to think I'm nice. Our goal is to be a nice person. We often say yes when we really want to say no. We make assumptions about what other people are thinking, but we've never actually talked to them about it. It's, it's like we think that we have the gift of reading someone's mind. And the truth is, we don't. We overfunction doing for others what they could and should be doing for themselves. It's a fancy word for that. Did you know that? It's called codependent. Uh, we hit a wall, we hit a hard time, and we quit and we give up too easily. We've never learned how to deal with conflict. So we do our best to avoid it. We've not learned how to deal with grief and loss. That's just nothing we've ever learned in our lives. We've not acknowledged our limits and begun to live within our God-given limits. And too many of us, we have a love and desire for Jesus, but that's never translated into a greater love for people. Get it? I, I love Jesus, I just don't care for people. That's what we're going to talk about today. Can I tell you those two things don't go together? Because if you love Jesus, you're going to love people. And if you don't love people, then you really don't love Jesus as much as you think. Ouch. I'll try to stay off your toes uh, today. Uh, we'll put another slide up. We have a zeal for scripture, but we still remain defensive, judgmental, critical, unapproachable, and unsafe as people. Think about all those terms, okay? I, I love God's word. <laughs> I, I, I'm just defensive, judgmental, critical, unapproachable, and unsafe. Huh? <laughs> so today, we're going to look at what God's word says underlies all emotional maturity, okay? What is it that God's word says? What's the mark of a mature follower of Jesus? You ready for it? It's agape love of Jesus in us that resides in us, and now we allow to flow to other people around us. That's the mark. That's the defining characteristic of a mature Christian. Locate with me in your Bibles, on your phones, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. The Apostle John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, explains very clear the love of Christ in us must be doing something with that love, okay? And it's not just holding on on the inside. If the love of Jesus is real and alive in us, then it's going to flow to others around us. If you're able, would you stand with me? Let's read out loud together 
verses 7 to 12, 1 John chapter 4. Here we go. Read with me. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. Let's pray. Lord, we need your help today to get down at core a very basic fact that you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us and sacrifice his life so that we could have eternal life and we could just pause and praise you for the next hour on that fact. But Lord, you've uh, called us to go further than that. You've called us as followers of your son Jesus to actually show that kind of love to the very people you've placed around us. And Lord, that's the hard part. Because Lord, the truth is we live in a world that's oftentimes not very loving. So would you help us today? Would you show us today? Would you give us the power today to go beyond just enjoying your love and give us the ability to actually start loving the people around us? We're going to need your help. We need your spirit. We need the power of your word. We welcome you here today. Come, take charge. Do a mighty work. Before we jump into your book, Lord, we just want to pause and we want to pray for uh, our brother in the church family here, Jeffrey Knight, and he's been through an awful week, and Lord, he just lost his second wife, and Lord, I, we just pray for lots of grace and comfort and strength for Jeff and his family and Lisa's family. Lord, we're grateful that Lisa knew you and she's promoted and we're grateful Lisa's doing really well. But Lord, we need your help. Jeff needs your help. So help him to know how much you love him today. Thanks again for the family uh, here, the church family here at Walloon. Thanks that we get to love on each other. Help us to do that well today. And all the church family said with one united voice, you can be seated. Up here on the screen, emotional maturity is rooted in the love of Jesus Christ. Maturity, emotionally, it's all about the love of Jesus in us. 1 John 3, verse 23 says this, And this is his commandment, we must believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> A genuine child, follower of Jesus Christ, doesn't just believe in Jesus. It's not just knowing and following and, and loving his book. A real child of Jesus, look what it says, and love one another just as Jesus has commanded us, okay? If we're really followers of Jesus Christ, we will splash the love of Jesus on everybody who Jesus brings in our path. That, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Back to 
chapter 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. We're commanded to live according to our position. We are children of our Creator, children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it says here the only source of agape love, that's the Greek word here, the only source of agape love is Jesus Christ, God with skin on. Therefore, look at verse 7, since we belong to Jesus, since we're connected to the only source of agape love, we're commanded, okay, you keep on loving one another. You keep on agapeing one another. Keep the love flowing. Keep the love splashing all around. That's the commandment here, verse 7. Verse 8, he continues. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If you're not loving, agapeing, sacrificing for the people around you, that's a bad sign, verse 8 says. Verse 8 is the mere opposite of verse 7. No agape flowing, no agape splashing. That's evidence that maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you need to ask the hard question because I don't see much love splashing on the people around me. Why? Because Jesus is love, he lives in us, he fills us with agape love. Agape love begets agape love. So, so the call to love doesn't start with us, it starts with Jesus, okay? And him flowing through us. Loveless Christianity is not possible. Say it with me. Loveless Christianity, it's not possible. It's like saltless salt. No, no. Or dry water. No, that doesn't make sense. Exactly. Loveless Christianity is not possible. Put it up here on, on the screen again. Emotional maturity is rooted in the love of Jesus Christ. It's the Father's willingness to send his one and only son so that we could have eternal life. And that's awesome, okay? The Father sending Jesus to die on the cross and rise again, that's what real love looks like. It's not that we loved Christ, okay? That's a good thing, but that's not what starts it, okay? It's that he loved us First, when we were still unlovable, when we were still ugly and ornery on the inside. Back to the text, verse 9. God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him, through Jesus. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our what? A sacrifice to take away our what? To sacrifice to take away everybody, our, our sins. Yeah, that was our chief issue in life. We're sinners and we needed a cure to our sin problem. The coming of Jesus to earth is a concrete historical fact. Jesus on the cross, allowing his blood to flow on the cross, that's the key point of revelation for God's agape love. It, it's God's love for you, for me. It's self-sacrifice. Agape love is not looking out for me, Nick. It's looking out for the person willing to sacrifice at our own expense for their good. Jesus loves us. Jesus rescued us, it says, from the penalty of sin. Well, 
that's because we're all loving and cuddly, Isaac, and, and lovely. No, 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 we weren't cuddly and adorable. The truth is, all of us, before Jesus broke through and got our hearts and our minds, we were sinful and selfish. It's because of the agape love of Jesus, willing to sacrifice for poor, ornery sinners like me. Can I get an amen there? Poor, ornery sinners like you. Do I get an amen there? <laughs> it's true. We're, we're, we're poor, ornery sinners before Jesus takes charge. Now, follow John's inspired logic. If we're this loved, if we're this agape so much that the Father would take drastic action, what drastic action did he take? I'm going to send my one and only son to be slaughtered on a Roman cross so that all people throughout all of history could be forgiven and given eternal life. That's agape love. You understand? That's what agape love, it's Jesus coming and willingly taking on all of our sin on the cross so that we could be given eternal life and forgiven of all of our sin. Back to the text, verse 11. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. <laughs> if we're loved that much, surely we ought to love each other. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Full expression in and through us. Track with me here. The unseen father is revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is seen and revealed in us as we show agape love to one another. Did you catch that? Let's go through it again, okay? The unseen Father is revealed in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is revealed and seen in us as we show his love to one another. It's really pretty slick. God's present and continuous activity of agape love is demonstrated to the world. How? Through you and me, okay? Or it's missing from the world because we're not loving as we've been commanded. It's either seen or it's missing in us. The key test of emotional maturity for you and for me, how you doing at loving the people around you? So I would ask, how you doing at sacrificing, at giving up your rights for those around you. How are you doing at loving your family, your friends? Let me give you the harder test. How are you doing at loving the people that drive you crazy? Got that person in your mind, that person who makes you nuts? How are you doing at showing them love? How are you doing at sacrificing on their account? Put back up here on the screen. First key, emotional maturity is rooted in the love of Jesus Christ. Second key, emotional maturity is learning to grow and mature and get better at loving those around us. It's, it's a growing thing. Love is a maturing thing. Love is something we work at getting better at showing the people around us the agape of Jesus. There's a developmental aspect to learning to love. Got a newborn baby? Right here. Okay? Pretend. Uh, and now the baby is bonded. Pretend I'm the mother of this baby. Okay, use your imagination, okay? Okay, got the baby here. 
okay? And it's bonded, but we don't expect the newborn baby to look after its mother's interests, do we? We, we don't expect the baby to say, Mom, I know you're tired. I know it's been a tough day. I've got a poopy diaper, but I'm just going to wait a few hours. No problem. I'm looking out for you. Is, is that what we would ever expect? And the answer is no, no. Uh, or I, I'm really hungry. I haven't eaten in a few hours, but I see you're busy, Mom. Just go ahead and do your work. I'll wait. I'll wait a few hours before I have to eat. And, and you go, no, that, that's ridiculous. We would never expect a baby to show much self-sacrifice. Fast forward 25 years. Now you have a 25-year-old child still acting like a baby, demanding to be waited. I, I don't want to get a job. It's hard. It, it's sweaty. I, I don't want to go to school. The teachers aren't nice to me. Bring me my food. Make my bed, Mommy. Wash my clothes. Fill my car with gas. And you go, you know what? Something is wrong. You're still acting like you're a child. You're still behaving as though you can't do anything. An adult who expects and demands others to wait on them. An adult who's like a sponge, drinking in, absorbing, taking advantage of love, but rarely giving love, is still behaving like an emotional child. And the truth is, there's lots of us who behave like emotional children. We expect everybody around us to jump, to take care of us, and rarely do we give. There's a word for that. It's pretty popular today. You know what it's called? It's being a narcissist. It's, it's what about me? What about me? What about my needs? And you're always wanting to know, what, what about me? Don't, don't forget me here. Pete Scazzaro writes about his marriage. Here's what he says. When Jer and I were married, we lit the unity candle and became one. The question we didn't answer was, which one? For the first years of our marriage, I unconsciously answered that question with, yes, Jerry, you and I are one, and I am the one. Loving people well, put it on the screen here, is the defining characteristic of a mature Christian. Learning to look out for you and not always for me is the defining characteristic of a mature Christian. Some of you might say, but Pastor Jeff, I'm, I'm not very good at that relational thing. It's, it's kind of mushy. It's kind of so. I, I'm not gift, gifted at showing people agape love. So we'll put up here on the screen. Let me remind you again. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. So I'm not good at it. I, I, I just am. Then you're owning emotionally. You're still a child. Loving people well is the defining characteristic of a mature Christian. And if you're not aspiring to that, that's a problem, okay? If I'm not willing to begin growing in that relational thing, if I'm not willing to learn to start sacrificing and looking out for the people around, if you're saying I'm content to remain emotionally and spiritually immature, then what you're saying is I'm just going to be okay stuck as an emotional infant or child or adolescent. I'm okay with that. That's what you're saying. First key, emotional maturity is rooted in the love of Jesus Christ. Second, emotional maturity is being willing to grow and mature and get better at loving those around us. I'm going to grow. I've got a ways to go, and we all do, 
I'm going to keep working at it. Third key, emotional maturity grows as we practice the presence of people. As we practice the presence of people. Author, theologian, Ronald Rollheiser, he tells this story. Listen. There was a four-year-old child who awoke one night frightened, convinced that in the darkness around her were all kinds of spooks and monsters. Alone, she ran to her parents' bedroom. Her mother calmed her down, taking her by the hand, uh, led her back into her own room where she put on a light and reassured the child with these words, you don't need to be afraid. You're not alone here. God's in the room with you. And the child replied, I know God's here, but I need someone in this room who has some skin. God knew (laughs) that we needed more than just words or assurances. God's everywhere, (laughs) and he loves you. He knew that we needed a God who had some skin. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take on a human body. He knew we needed God with skin on. Now track with me here. Today, God still comes to us with skin, physical form. How? Through his body, his church. Through his children. All of us who know Jesus have Jesus in spirit form residing. Point to where Jesus, in, where, where is it residing? Where is he residing? Right here. He resides in us. We're called to be God with skin on to the people around us. You tracking? Okay. But people who actually practice being God with skin on for the people around him are pretty rare. People who go around realizing I'm Jesus' representative and I'm called to live like Jesus to the people around me, it's pretty rare. Why? Are you ready? Because it means I have to die to me and my needs and my wants. It means I have to die to what about me? What what about me? What about my stuff? What about my interests? What about what I want to do? Do you understand? Instead of, what can I do to serve you? Instead of, what can I do to give for your benefit? That's why it's rare. (laughs) Because it's really hard to say no to my needs and look out for your needs instead. I want to close three Practical dynamics in loving others well. Three practical ways that we can love other people well. First, we're called to enter into another person's world. Jesus left the glory and the splendor of heaven to enter our world. Do you understand? We are called to leave our world by leaning in and listening to the people he puts into our path. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty good at acting like I'm listening to you, Myron, but I'm really thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch or what great answer I'm about to give to you, to your question, to show you how smart I am, instead of just leaning in and listening and giving you my eyes and not be thinking about everything but what you're saying to me. You tracking? That's how we lean in to each other. We, we lean in, we maintain eye contact. I'm fully present. I drop my guard. Myron, I'm open. I'm approachable. I show you I'm caring by listening. And I promise you, for most of us, That doesn't come naturally. For most of us, that doesn't come easily. Okay? Because I got things to do. I got places to go. Uh, Second 
practical dynamic in loving other people as well. I need to hold on to the fact that love for Jesus translates into my love for people. If I really say I love others, then I am going to have to let the love of Jesus start flowing through me. The Pharisees of Jesus' day knew their Bible. They practiced spiritual disciplines. They prayed regularly. They worshiped faithfully. But they were defensive, judgmental, and unsafe to be around. You understand? Unless we are allowing the love of Jesus to fill us, and then I'm actively ready to give it away, then I'm just behaving like the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Third, we must make loving others our top priority. Top priority. Followers of Jesus should be the best lovers of people on the face of the earth. And the fact that no one said amen shows us it's not our top priority, okay? We must make our top priority. Number one, we should be the best lovers of people on the face of the earth. Okay, I'm going to give you another run because now we got about a dozen. Okay, we're, we're growing here. We really are. We need to make our number one priority that followers of Jesus, we should be the best lovers of people on the face of the earth. We should be. That was much better. Well done. I'm telling you, that, that's number one. John 13, 34, 35. Here's what Jesus said. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Verse 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love, your agape for one another is proof that you're one of my followers. Wow. Loving others is the defining characteristic for a mature follower of Jesus. How, how do you know if you're mature in Christ, how good are you at loving the people around you? Sacrificing, giving for them, learning to love others, especially with those who drive us crazy. <laughs> that should have the same amount of attention as we give to learning to love God and study his book. We're pretty good at that part. Oh, I, I know God's word, and I'm pretty good at, at, at loving him, but we should give the same amount of time and attention to loving one another. Because Jesus said those two loves go together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor how? As good or better than you treat yourself. So the two loves, love for God, love for others, here's what Jesus said, they go together. You can't separate them. They, they, they are the same. If, you're, if you really are filled with the love of Jesus, then you're going to show it to the people around you. Loving people well is the defining characteristic of a mature Christian. How you doing? How you doing? Would you be willing to take a test, an assessment to find out how well? Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for making it very, very clear what you expect from us, your kids. <clears throat> and I also, Lord, want to say, what you want from us is really hard. It goes against our natural way of thinking and speaking and behaving. So we're going to need your help. Would you help us to learn to love those you've placed in our lives? 
Lord, would you help us in this week ahead to love our wives better, our husbands, our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, our fellow students, even our enemies. <laughs> Empower us to splash your agape love everywhere we go in this week ahead. And I'm praying, Lord, that you might give many the courage and the boldness to take this test, this assessment, to find out where their emotional maturity really is. Lord, I don't want to assume or presume that everybody here today or everybody watching online has received the gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ offers freely. Romans 5.8 tells us, but God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 14, 6 explains, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In John 1, 12, we're told, but to all who believe in Jesus and accept him, Jesus gives the right to become children of God. Here's a fact. Jesus died for you and me. While we were still sinners, Jesus arose from the dead for you and for me. He built the bridge to eternal life. Will you believe those facts for you? Jesus, I believe. And will you receive him by faith? Right now. Welcome him into your life. Jesus, I open the door of my life. Come on in. I invite you in. Be my Savior, my King, my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> we should be the most thankful people on earth and the most loving because of what you've done. We love you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray all these things.